3. As we've studied through the book of Esther, you'll realize that this is about 450 years before the birth of Christ, but it was after the children of Israel had been carried away captive uh, for 70 years. Now, the uh, 10 northern tribes were carried away, and they were dispersed to all the world uh, in about 725 B.C., and then at 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came against the city of Jerusalem and against the two northern tribes. And uh, then at uh, 586, uh, he came in and dis dis destroyed the temple and all of that. And uh, these uh, Jews then were taken to Babylon and were in captivity in Babylon. Well, at uh, 536, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire came and uh, destroyed the uh, Babylonish Empire, which had taken them captive, and uh, Cyrus, the Mede, had turned them loose and said, you can go back home. And many of them did, under Ezra and Zerubbabel and uh, Nehemiah. They had gone back to uh, the cities of Jerusalem and settled in Judea. But there were thousands and thousands of Jews that were scattered all over this empire. And this empire, this Medo-Persian empire, went all the way uh, from India all the way to Ethiopia and included Ethiopia. It was a world empire in those days, a civil civilized world. That included all of the land of Palestine. It included Jerusalem and all of the cities of Judea. All of that was under the Medo-Persian empire. Now, so now we have uh, Esther born in captivity, born in uh, the uh, Medio Persian Empire, in around Babylon, around Sushan. They moved to the south, to a city southwest, uh, southeast of uh, Babylon. And uh, there was Sushan where they built the palace. Esther was there, a very beautiful girl. And uh, the king, as we studied in chapter 1, the king had a beautiful queen whose name was Vashti, and she refused to put on a dance and a show before all these 127 princes that had come from the provinces, and she refused to do so, and uh, they said because of that she would be banished, she would be divorced from the king, and uh, he would never have anything to do with her again. She's gone. And so they came to him, his counselors, and said, you need another lady who will be your queen. You can't be without a queen. And uh, so four years later, after they had sent, sent into all of these 127 provinces and had brought in fair maidens, these virgin girls, and uh, then uh, through a system of uh, selection, uh, there came Esther. And the king, Ahasuerus, just fell in love with her and he said, this is the one. She's going to be the new queen. And so in chapter 2, we saw her crowned. And now we have Esther, the queen. Uh, she's a Jew, but she's not letting anybody know that at this point. But uh, she's the queen. Now, about four years later, something happens. And we pick up the reading in chapter 3. Remember one other thing before we read chapter 3, though was that Mordecai, uh, who was her cousin, Mordecai had taken her because her father and mother had died, and he had raised her. And, uh, and so he had become a, a person of importance in the empire because he had done something wonderful. He had saved the king's life. He had heard about a plot, and there were two people who had gotten together in a plot, and they were probably his, uh, his uh, guards, his bodyguards, and they were plotting to kill King Ahasuerus. And Mordecai found out about it, get, got the word to Queen Esther, and Queen Esther uh, instructed him about it, and they found the investigator too. It was absolutely a fact. There was a plot to kill him. And, and because uh, Mordecai had sent the message through Esther, uh, she went to the king and gave him the message in Mordecai's name said, Mordecai's the one. He found that out. They investigated and uh, sort of they took those two out and hanged them, and it saved the king's life. Now we come to chapter 3. After these things did King Ahasuerus 
promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Now, here is a man named Haman, and he is elevated to a position over all of the princes in all of the 127 provinces. And he is given authority. He is raised up in the kingdom. And the king demands that when anybody see him, they bow down to him. Wow, what a position. And uh, all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, that he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. Now, you get the picture here. Here is a man named Mordecai. He is one of the leaders. He comes to the king's gate regularly. He is in the kingdom, but he refuses to bow down to this Haman. Why would he not bow down? Well, he said, because I'm a Jew. That's why. And uh, he had been raised as a Jew, and he had been instructed in the Scriptures and the scriptures had given very clear message about this. In fact, in the book of Exodus, I'll read uh, verse 2 of chapter number 20. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Amen. The message is very clear. You are not to bow down to anybody but God himself. The Jews lived that way. They would not bow and uh, they refused to ever bow. You remember what happened uh, when uh, you read in the book of Daniel? When... Uh, the three Hebrew boys refused to bow down to the golden image that he had set up. You remember they told him, if you don't bow down, you're going to be cast into the burning fiery furnace. You remember the story. And they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down to your golden image. We just won't do that. We don't bow down to anybody but God himself. You remember... Jesus being tempted by the devil. You remember out there on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was tempted? And, and the Bible says something about that. Satan said, uh, I'm going to show you something. He took him to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory thereof. And he said, Satan said to Jesus, all of this will I give you if you'll just bow down to me. And Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. <laughs> you remember when when uh, John was writing out there on the Isle of Patmos, and he had seen these great visions, he's writing about the future, the revelation that we have in our Scripture. And when the angel appeared to John, he bowed down, and the angel said, Oh, don't, don't do that. You bow down to no one but God. Don't worship me. I'm just an angel. You'll never bow to anybody. Don't bow to an angel. Don't bow to anybody because God is a jealous God. He said, I'm only worthy to bow down. You don't bow to anybody. By the way, that still holds today. We don't bow down to anybody. Don't make any images to bow down to them. God alone is worthy of all of our worship and adoration and praise. Our God is a jealous God. He only is worthy. And so we have the message given to us here. Mordecai said, I'm a Jew. I don't bow down. Just don't do it. <laughs> no, you know, I honor him for that, don't you? That was a great thing. He had some backbone. It's about time that God's people got a backbone. 
My goodness, we've got so many weaklings and cowards today in the pulpits of America. Instead of standing up for the Word of God and saying, God said it, that settles it, let's do it. Well, we don't want to offend anybody. And we don't want to make anyone mad. And we just want to kind of soften the message. We've got a guy out of Dallas, Texas, down there somewhere out in that area saying, I'll never preach on hell because I don't want to scare people. And I'll never preach on sin because I don't want to offend anybody. In other words, I'm not God's man. I'm somebody else's, but I'm not God's man because God's man is going to warn them about hell and he's going to talk about sin and he's going to preach the truth that you need a Savior. You must be saved. You must be born again. You must turn from your sin. Turn to Jesus who died for you on the cross. He suffered, bled, and died for you. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus and receive his forgiveness. Well, we don't have many with a backbone anymore. You know, I, 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 I weep over that. I read this president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And I read some about him yesterday. It just breaks my heart. And he said, uh, he said, you know, I, the Book of Mormon, uh, Book of Romans, he said, I, I, it, it just scares me. He said, I don't like the Book of Romans. The president of the convention don't like a part of the Bible? For goodness sake, where are we in this world today? Let's get back to standing where God stands on things. Folk, it's time. It's time. We need to make a stand. We don't need any more sissies in the pulpit, nor in the pews. We need to have people standing for the truth of God. You know Mordecai, you got to love him. Hey, I'm going to bow down. But you ought to bow down. No, I'm not going to do it. But you know, the king commanded it. <laughs> Who's the king? I worship the living God who created heaven and earth. Do I serve God or do I serve the king? When there's a difference, you serve God. Forget about the king. And that's the way it is today. The government is over us, but if a government ever tells you to do something contrary to God, God is over the government. You obey God rather than man. That's a direct quotation from the scripture. All right. Now we got about Haman. Haman's a little upset over this. Reading on. It came to pass when they spake daily to him that he was, uh, said, I'm a Jew. I will not bow down. Verse 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Wow. Even the people of Mordecai. Did you get it? Let's destroy all of the Jews, every one of them. Did you know there's something besides Haman going on here? There's someone besides Haman going on. Do you know what it is? Do you know who it is? Well, of course you do. Satan himself is behind this. Satan has had a hate affair to the Jews all the way from the time of Abraham. Why? Well, because God said to Abraham, I'm going to change your name from Abram, which is high father, unto Abraham, the father of many nations, and in you shall all of the nations of the world be blessed. He's talking about Jesus coming through that nation of Israel. When Isaac came along, he said, in Isaac shall thy seed to be called. He saith not to seeds as to many, but unto one unto thy seed, which is Christ. Christ is going to be coming through this line. And it was through the Jewish nation that God gave us the Bible. All the Old Testament, the New Testament, written by the Jewish people. God has blessed them and blessed the whole world through the Jews. And that's why Satan has had a hate affair. He hates anybody that would give the word of God that denounces his doom. Because the scriptures tell us what's going to happen to Satan in the end. Did you know it's not a, rea it's, it's not a reality that Satan's in control? 
He's just allowed some authority right now. He's a defeated foe, and the Lord, the Lord God, and the Lord Jesus is going to cast Satan into the lake of fire where he'll be tormented day and night forever and forever. Amen. That's his doom. Remember what the demons used to say when Jesus came along? How you come to torment us before our time? They knew their time is coming. They know where they're going to be. Satan knows where he's going to be. He hates the Jewish people. He's done everything he can to annihilate the Jews. He tried it through Nebuchadnezzar, and then he tried it through these different various empires. And then uh, in our day, he tried it through Hitler, remember? Hitler had a hate affair, and he wanted to destroy all the Jews, and he murdered some six million of them. And did you not only that, know that uh, Stalin did the same thing in Russia and killed millions of Jews? They've tried to do that throughout the years, but they've always failed. Amen. They've always failed but they're, because God chose them to give us the Scriptures, but to more than that, to give us the Savior. Did you know what? In the very beginning back there, you remember in the book of Genesis, when they sinned against the Lord, because the serpent was in, he was, uh, Satan actually totally controlled. And, and Satan spoke through the serpent and deceived Eve. And Adam knew what he was doing and went ahead and did it. But did you know what the judgment was? The seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. That's what he said, remember? That's talking about Jesus, the seed of the woman. And Jesus is going to come and crush the devil's head. He's going to be defeated. And so Satan has hated the scriptures. He's hated the Jewish people. And he still does to this day. Now watch what happens. Mordecai, you're in trouble. You didn't bow down. I, I like that song. Don't you like that song where it said about the three Hebrew children? They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, and they wouldn't burn. <laughs> I love that. Maybe we can get somebody to sing that around here. That's a great song. Well, think about this. Mordecai's in trouble. Oh, yeah, now he's real trouble. And he was uh, going to be a recipient of the wrath of Haman. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, and in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, that's about four years now after Queen, uh, Queen Esther became the queen, uh, and uh, they cast Pur, and um, Pur is the lot, and uh, they cast the lot from day to day before Haman, from day to day, from month to month, under the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. Every month from the first of the year all the way through the year, every day they cast lots. They want to try to find a specific day. And what was that for? That was the day that they were going to announce we're going to annihilate the Jews from the face of the earth. And that's what it was all about. Then Haman said to the king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people Neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not fit for the king's prophet to suffer them. Now, in other words, we're going to have to do away with this people here. These people are the Jews. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver, that's over a million dollars in our money today, into the hands of those that have charge of the business, and those people who are over your treasury. I'm going to give them 10,000 talents so we can go out there and kill all these Jews to bring it into the king's treasuries. Wow. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadetha, uh, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee. I don't want it. He said, you don't have to pay that 10,000 talents of silver. You, you're willing to do it, and I'm willing to, but, but I don't need it, and so you don't have to give it. So the silver is given to thee. The people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. 
you can go ahead, you have my permission, you can destroy this Jewish nation. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were in every province and the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language. In the name of the king Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. The letters were sent by posts. That's uh, the early days. This was the uh, Western Union. I mean, th this is uh, the people in those days. They had uh, the Pony Express. This was it. They sent the post. And to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, when they were taking these lots, every day they took lots, every day, and the lot came out on the 13th day of the 12th month. That was going to be the day when they would destroy all of the Jews, which is a month later, to take the spoil of them for a prey. You not only can destroy the Jews, but you can steal everything that they have and take it home with you as a prey. And the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given to every province was published unto all the people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out being hastened by the king's commandment and the decree was given in Shushan the palace and the king and Haman sat down to drink. Boy, they, Haman's having a big day now. He's having his way. He's sitting there with the king, second only to the king. And he's sitting there, and he's having a drink with the king. And all is well. He's going to have his will done. Actually, Satan's will is going to be done through him. And they're going to destroy the Jewish race. But the city Shushan was perplexed. Why, they said, should this be so? Why? Because they sent this letter out to everybody and they announced on the 13th day of the last month, that's the day we're going to exterminate the Jews. And the people in Shushan, they said, why? Many of those Jews owned businesses. They were neighbors and friends. Why should this be so? And they didn't really understand what was going on. I want you to see something today. And I want you to see that this is a picture of what's going on in the world today. You say, it's not only the Jews, but it's every believer in Jesus Christ who's saved by the Jew, Jesus. We are numbered also of those that are despised by Satan himself. We're God's people. And Satan has a hate affair for you and for me. And don't you think you're different? You can't duck this. This is true. Satan hates you. Amen. He is our enemy. As a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible is very clear about this. And do you want to understand we're in a battle? We're in a battle. For our lives as Christians, we're a battle for this nation. And we're in a battle for our freedom in the world. And we must stand up for Jesus Christ our Savior and stand up for what's right or we're going to lose it all. I hope you understand that we are in a very perilous time. In the last days, perilous times shall come. That's what your word says. And we're in that time right now. We're in perilous times. And beloved, we need to get a backbone. We need to get some real muscle on us, spiritual muscle. And we need to put on the armor of God. And we need to stand for what's right in this world and not be run over by everything that comes down the pike. Amen. You're going to lose your freedom if you don't stand. It's time for you. Now, I know that sounds very alarming, and some people don't like the thought that we're in a battle. 
You'd much rather be on the couch and just watching uh, Hallmark. Just smile, and all is well. But all is not well. All is not well. We're in perilous times. And beloved, we need to make a stand for our Savior. We need to make a stand for freedom. We need to stand for what we have in this country given to us by the grace of God through people who are willing to lay down their lives for us and give us a constitution that's right and honored God, the Creator, and who gives to us the freedoms that we enjoy. We're going to lose them if we don't stand up. I hope you understand that even though Satan is your enemy, you have victory. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The announcement that we're in a battle, that's just reason for us to put on the armor and make a stand because our general, the captain of our enemies, he is victorious over sin, hell, death, and the grave. He's our Lord. And we're going to be all right. He is Lord of all. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to be fine. We may suffer. I wept with a broken heart yesterday as I saw a dozen Christians all lined up bowed down, Taliban soldiers behind them, given a chance to deny Christ, would not do so. And I watched them. They made a tape of this. It was on the net. And they had each soldier behind each person. And they gave the word in this one. And he shot him in the back of the head and he fell over. And then he stood over him and shot him again. And then it was the next one's turn. And for 12 of them in a row, they murdered these Christians. That's what's going on in Afghanistan. You didn't see that on NBC, CBS, ABC, MSNBC, and all the rest of the media that's sold out. You don't see the truth. But these missionaries got these tapes. They made them there and watched them surreptitiously and sent them out so we could see what's actually going on. They murdered them one after another, after another, after another, after another. And I sat and watched and wept. I, I, I just, it broke my heart to see that. And not only then, when they finished, they corpses lay in there. They took their guns and they just mowed them and, and destroyed those corpses. They just emaciated and scattered blood and guts everywhere. All 12 of them just, mur just emptied their guns in it. Just rap, 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 emptied their guns. That wasn't a Hollywood movie. That's reality. That's what's going on in this world. And if you don't get a little upset over that, if you don't get upset that we've just backed away and let those Christians suffer, something is wrong. Amen. I'm not being political. We shouldn't have been there to start with. I understand that. We should have come out of there a long time ago. I understand that. But I want you to understand something. If somebody else had been in control, they would have gotten those people out in safety before they took the, in, took the guns and out. And they would never have left all of those arms to the enemies of God. Billions of arms and helicopters and, and tanks, all of them given over to the enemies in order to fight against Israel and to fight against God's people. That would never have happened under somebody else. But it troubles me, I hope it troubles you, to see people murdered like that. The only thing that gives you any peace at all is that they said, we won't deny Christ. We're going to heaven, and it's going to be okay. 
Are you going to be able to stand when the trouble comes to this country? If we don't get some better leadership, it's coming our way. Are you going to be able to stand? Are you willing to stand? Shushan, the city, was perplexed. I think that describes a lot of God's people. They're looking at it and saying, what in the world is going on? What in the world is going on? I'm telling you what's going on, folk. What's going on is we are coming to the end of the age, and we better be looking up. Our redemption draws nigh. Amen. Jesus may come at any moment. Amen. Jesus will go take his church out of here before that tribulation takes place in the world. God's people will be gone, and he's coming. There's a pastor of a church. I believe I read it was in Georgia, probably. Pastor preached on the second coming. He looked over the congregation and said, How many of you people believe that Jesus is going to come back in the next hour? Not a single hand went up. Then he read his text, Watch ye for such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. You know, he did that to bring home the fact that most of God's people are pretty much asleep to the truth. I hope you're not. I think we're different than most churches, I hope. We believe the Bible. We stand on the Bible. And we believe the Bible from cover to cover. And we believe Jesus is coming. And it might be today. Amen. We may see him before this day is over. Amen. May God help us to love his appearing. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we look to you in the name of